All right, everybody, let's talk about your favorite air drummer and mine, your man, Rick Beato. If you are not familiar, uh, Rick Beato is a very successful music YouTuber. He's like a, a music theory guy, I would say, first and foremost. I know he used to like teach music theory as like a master's degree in music theory or composition or something like that. Uh, very, you know, knows a ton about music. You might know him for a lot of his videos where he reacts to the Spotify top charts and breaks them down and stuff like that. I think Rick and I have a very, very different way of listening to music and uh, a very different point of view on music. However, I respect his opinion very much. So let's check this out. This is this video called, if you're a musician in 2024, you want to hear this. And uh, basically what he's gonna talk about in this video is some of the uh, big trends happening in music right now. And, and I'm gonna give you my thoughts on them as well. And really quickly, I also wanted to mention my Patreon. If you like what I do on YouTube and everywhere else, joining my Patreon really helps me do this full time and worry less about videos getting demonetized by YouTube or copyright claimed by labels. Patrons get all my podcasts and main channel videos early. There are members only channels in my Discord that I'm super active in. I also do giveaways. For example, I've been giving away a lot of Emo's Not Dead merch and you can also have me review your music, artwork, or anything else. All you need to do is join my Patreon at the $10 level, and then every month I do a call for submissions. If you want me to review something, just drop it in the comments of that post, and then I will review it live on Twitch. So if any of that sounds cool to you, hit the link in the description of this video, and I appreciate your support. Okay, this is going to be an interesting video, I think. There's a company who reached out to me a few months ago. It's called Chart Cipher. And what they do is they use AI and they compile trends based on the billboard charts. But every company has to say they do AI. No, I don't know anything about this company. So maybe they really do. But every company has got to say, we use AI to do blank. It's like uh, five years ago, it was, we use blockchain to analyze trends in music. Then it was, uh, we use Web3 to analyze trends in music. Now it's, we use AI to analyze trends in music. Uh, so yeah, I don't know anything about this company, but I just think it's kind of funny how, you know, you see like the hot trend in tech change like every 18 months. Uh, curious to see what the next one will be. It's trends over years and years, but you can see kind of what is happening in music now. And these are some really interesting things because they talk about topics of songs, how many words are in the titles, things like that, nerdy things that I really think are interesting. So one of the- Okay, well, if it's nerdy stuff that Rick likes, then I'm pretty sure it's gonna be nerdy stuff that you guys like too. So let's check it out. First things in here is the primary genre trend chart. You'll notice that it says that hip hop at 27% and pop no at surprise. 27%. So no, no surprises here, right? Hip hop and pop are the top two genres. No surprises there. It's been this way for, I don't know, probably at least at least 10, maybe 15 years, right? Country more popular than rock since fucking when? Well, since last year, actually, which is what we will talk about here. For sure, country is more popular than rock at the moment. Country is having a big moment. The next is country at 20%, then rock 19%, R&B is at 9%, Latin is at 6%, and then at the bottom here is dance. The part that surprised me actually about this is that Latin was so small because if you include people like Bad Bunny in that and J Balvin, like those are like two of the most popular artists in the world. And every time I look at the spot, the Spotify, let's, let's look Spotify top 50. Every time I look at this, there's like a ton of, oh, nice work, Spotify DevOps team. Nice work. Page not available. Shout out to the Spotify SREs as usual. So let's look here. Every time I look, there's a bunch of like Spanish songs. Oh, here's one. This guy, Javi, I guess is his name. So there's two. Let's see, there's more Bad Bunny. I don't know if this is would count as a Latin song, Contigo. There's probably some other people right here. I don't know who they are. But point being, I'm always surprised at how many Latin songs are on the top 50. There aren't that many this time, so I don't know. But that was the big surprise to me, is that Latin was as low as it is. But probably true, I guess. This is a good question, yeah. Is reggaeton considered Latin or rap? That's a good question. It wouldn't surprise me if it's considered hip hop, which would explain a lot. Or electronic music. If you go to the next chart, this is where it gets interesting. Because okay. then you look at 
essentially 2019 to 2023. So the last- Oh, okay. I saw at least three you didn't notice. Well, there we go. That's four years what the trends are. And you'll notice that this top thing here is hip hop music, which has actually gone down a lot on the charts. It's gone from 53% dominance, then 58% in 2020, but now it's way down to 27%. So this is the first thing that I thought was really interesting, which I've heard a lot of people in hip hop media talk about how hip hop is dying in the past couple years. I don't know. I sort of took that with a grain of salt because I feel like people are always trying to say that this is dying or that is dying. You know, it's usually not true, especially because like hip hop has been so dominant. Like basically, so here, here's my take on it. Starting in 1992, when Dr. Dre and Snoop came out with uh, nothing but a G thing, since that day, like hip hop just became more and more and more and more and more popular in terms of not only how many albums it's selling, but most importantly, it's cultural influence, right? Because, you know, look at say like the NBA, for example, like the NBA now is like really like infused with hip hop culture, which was not true when I was a kid. Like the culture of the NBA when I was a kid had nothing to do with any kind of music. Like the NFL doesn't have any cultural ties with any genre of music, but the NBA does. And I would say that's like an example of how culturally influential hip hop had become. And so I was skeptical when people would say like, oh, hip hop is dying. But then you saw some of these things happen last year. Like there was one week, I think, where people were talking about how there hadn't been a number one hip hop album in like 10 months or something. I think Lil Uzi Vert might have been the first person to like have a number one hip hop album in like a year or something. So I think it's kind of true. I agree with this comment here. People are tired of auto-tune rappers and female rappers, to be honest. I actually think that's true. You know, that's sort of like a cliche rock fan to say like, oh, people are so tired of auto-tune and all these like rapper, you know, these stripper rappers. That's like such a cliche rock fan thing to say, but I think it's actually true. In my personal opinion, I think hip hop really started its decline in like 2019 or 2020 when the melodic trap style became popular. I think like The Box by Roddy Rich, to me, that was like the moment that hip hop started to become kind of uninspired to me personally. I think hip hop became more about the personalities than it did the music. And so I think even though hip hop is definitely still as culturally relevant, as ever. I think it's been a while since there was like a really big hip hop song that was like a cultural moment, right? You know, and all the stripper rappers, like I like that stuff. It's cool. I like that stuff, but there's just so much of it. And it's like, people are tired of hearing yet another like ratchet girl rapper or yet another like auto tune, you know, melodic trap rapper. It's just like, I think people are over it. That's my thought about what he's talking about here with the decline of hip hop. I think it's like everything else. It just eventually becomes oversaturated and full of copycats and people are just ready to move on to the next thing. That's what I think. So hip hop is going down in its the way it's represented on the charts. People are less interested in hip hop music. I would say that pop music has stayed relatively the same, 30%, yeah. 22 or 23, and then it's back at 27. So, you know, fluctuating between 30 Rick's got to do his, uh, what is that? Is that a, a P test to determine if the variance of those is statistically significant? I can't do that math in my head. I don't know, but we'll trust that Rick did. Percent and 23%, let's say, but 27 last year. And then the things that are on the rise are really country and rock. See yeah, so this is interesting stuff. I'll, I'll let Rick talk about it, but here's the two main points to think about here. The narrative is the country and rock are on the rise. And so let's talk about that. It says right here, since 2022 to 2023, country has moved from 8% up to 20%. Of its Big one, right? Huge, huge. And you remember there was a week last year, I think towards the end of last year, when I want to say that like four of the five top songs in the Billboard charts were all country songs. It was like Morgan Wallen, Zach Bryan, Jelly Roll or something. I don't remember what it was, but very clearly in 2023, country had a moment. There's even that song called Country's Cool Again. And it's clear this is happening. Of course, Beyonce is doing a country song. Post Malone said he's going to do a country album. Like country is most definitely having a moment. Representation on the Billboard charts. That's a 150% increase. That's massive. I've noticed this when I do the top 10 yep. Spotify countdowns. 
that there's a lot of country songs on the charts now that there yep. never were before, right? Rock has moved up from 12% to 19%. That's a 58% increase. Now, here's the thing that I think, here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is the thing that I think a lot of rock fans are gonna sort of wanna highlight here is supposedly that rock is having this big resurgence, okay? And they're gonna talk about bands like Sleep Token and Bad Omens. But I hate to burst your bubble here, but that's not what's happening here. Number one, you need to understand that rock and metal are two different things, okay? And when people say rock charts, they're not talking about Bad Omens and Sleep Token. Yes, it's Olivia and MGK. <laughs> it literally is probably that. So let's take a look at what they mean when they say rock charts, okay? Let's look. I'm thinking solo artists using guitars. That's more like it. So let's let's look. This is Billboard's hot rock songs from last week. And you tell me. So for everyone that's like, see, I told you, Sleep Token's taking over the world. Bad Omens is taking over the world. You know, Lorna Shore is taking over. I told you, bro. Let's take a look at these charts. And you tell me if that supports the story that you want to tell here. So the number one rock song is Zach Bryan and Casey Musgraves, which I would argue is country. Number two song on the rock songs chart is Stick Season by Noah Cahan. Let's listen to that so you can see what, what they mean when they say rock is this. Okay. This is rock in the eyes of Billboard. Yeah, indie folk Mumford and Sons kind of stuff. And I'm, and I'm not saying this is bad. I think this is a totally fine song. Nothing wrong with it. But if you read this article or watch Rick's video and you're like, yeah, see, look, rock is back. Sleep Token's the biggest band in the world. It's like, well, hold on. So you can see here. Uh, then it's like, you know, Tracy Chapman, Jelly Roll, more Zach Bryan, TV Girl. Again, this is another example of what rock means in the context of these Billboard charts. Is this, right? This is rock in the eyes of Billboard. And I'm not saying this is bad. You know, if you like this, that's totally cool. But my point here is that if you see these articles saying that rock you know, rock is back and you think that that means that the kind of music you like is more popular than it used to be, that's the part where I would maybe pump the brakes a little bit because when they say rock does not mean Bad Omens and Sleep Token. Let's put it that. Unfortunately, I think that'd be cool. The only song or the only band here that I would say really fits, maybe two songs on here that would fit that definition would be One More Time by Blink-182, which was uh, number 20. And then there's uh, this uh, Shine Down song. Those are the only ones that I would say kind of, you know, fit the definition of what most people would think of as rock. So just wanted to clarify that. That's a 58% increase, which is cool. And like I said, hip hop is down 37%, as you can see here. I think people are, are getting tired of hip hop. I noticed that the trap beats, that, uh, that, that drum sound, that you used to hear constantly on the chart when I started doing these these top 10 countdowns a few years ago really has disappeared. I think people are just bored with it. And then Yeah, I, I agree with that too. And again, this is another one of these kind of like stereotypical rock boomer things like, you know, tr yeah, trap more like crap. Uh, you know, I'm not like anti-trap at all. I, I love trap. But I do think it's true that people are kind of tired of it. If that's going to come down, something's going to replace it. And it seems to be rock and country are moving up. Okay, yep, the next chart is. that I think is interesting here is instrument prevalence trends. So it says here, almost all streaming hits contain pr primarily drums and bass. Of course, we know that. The prominent use of guitar surged to the highest level in over... I think the better question is who gives a shit what's popular? Well... I give a shit what's popular. If you don't give a shit what's popular, that's fine. People ask me this a lot or bring this up a lot. They're like, well, you know, why do you care so much what's popular? And I will tell you why. Number one, because, you know, I'm a marketer and that's like just my job to care about it. But number two is because if you want more good music that you like, then you should care what's popular. The reason being that if musicians can make money playing music that you like, then they will create more of it. That's why if you love, I don't know, ska, that means you should want more people to make a living playing ska because then you will have more opportunities to go see ska bands and to hear ska albums because these people will actually be able to focus all their energy on it rather than have to work part time as a fucking bartender or whatever and, you know, barely scrape by a living. Artists care. Exactly. 
Exactly. That's what it is. So why should you as a fan care what's popular? You know, you shouldn't necessarily, but I, I do think that it matters in the sense of if you want people to make more of the thing, they need to be able to make some money at it. That's all. For a decade, this is in due in part to both the rising country and rock, as we just said in the last segment. Conversely, the use of piano has been on the decline. Okay. Pretty interesting. Okay. If you look at the chart, you'll... So this is kind of interesting. Um, so this is like what instruments are used in song. I think it's kind of weird that they chose bass, drums, guitar, and piano. That seems kind of weird to me because there's lots of other instruments that they could use and like, you know, do like tuned 808s count as bass? I don't know. Kind of interesting. I wonder why there was this spike in piano in 2021, like a huge spike. I don't know. You'll see this instrument prevalence here with the bases in this uh, mauve color, whatever this is, kind of purplish. Then the drums. Here's here's what I want to know. It says 94% of songs. What are the 6% of songs that don't have bass or drums? Like just literally only vocals? I don't know. Okay, so to put it more succinctly, the use of the guitar okay. on songs that are on the Billboard charts from 2022 to 2023 has gone up 56%. So this is another thing that I think people are going to really be excited about. See, the guitar is more popular than ever, which is definitely true. I would like to see this going back to like 2019. But like if you listen to popular music, which I do, you will definitely hear that there is a lot more guitar in, you know, mainstream music. Like, say, in 2017, you couldn't hear a fucking guitar in any mainstream song at all. Like it just there was no guitar in songs back then it's because of emo rap absolutely i think so so now you hear stuff like this for example one of my favorite artists uh rod wave a lot of stuff like this you hear that like kind of clean guitar a lot more of that kind of thing so I, I think that's interesting but just to be clear again when you see this you may think oh yeah master puppets hell yeah riffs well not exactly what they're talking about is more often than not either the sort of like indie like acoustic guitar kind of stuff or loops that are used in a lot of pop and hip-hop they're not talking about you know big riffs like, you know, you may be thinking. Due to 2023 has gone up 56% and the use of the piano has gone down 41%. Now, RIP I guess people piano. are not taking piano lessons. Actually, that's kind of a joke because the piano is all MIDI anyways. The next thing I find fascinating are the song length trends. Now, there's a really interesting article in the Washington Post about- I was very surprised by this, actually. This is pretty interesting. Check this out. A week and a half ago about how songs are getting shorter and shorter. And they actually showed from the 1960s when- Look at this, this is crazy. He'll talk about this. I had no idea that songs were this short back in the 50s and that they got this long in the 90s. This, this was very surprising, I had no idea. Songs were routinely under three minutes and then that peaked in the 1990s, the early 90s, really, at over four minutes. And now Brutal. they're back four under minutes. three Ugh. minutes. Most of the songs on the pop charts are two minutes. It's really interesting because I was driving my daughter Layla to school. She said to me, uh, can you play some new songs? So I start playing new songs. We were listening to that song, Greedy, by Tate McRae. Two minutes and 20 seconds. And then the next song we listened to was two minutes and 15 seconds. Then two minutes and 18 seconds. Those are she short said, songs. That's like little pump every song length under songs. Three minutes? I said, yeah. And so I said, you know, all the Beatles early songs are under three minutes too. So I start playing the Red Album. Now this is, I had no idea that their songs were this short. Look at this. Some of these are like grindcore length. The 62 to 66 album. And really all those songs are under three minutes. Love Me Do, two minutes and 20 seconds. Please okay. Please Me, 201. From Me To You, 157. Look at this, 157. That's practically like a Pig Destroyer song. Seven. She Loves You, 222. I Want to Hold Your Hand, 226. All My Love in I mean, These are very Can't short songs. Love, 213. And these are ride, some of their biggest 311. songs. Amazing, right? Even songs like Nowhere Man, 244, Michelle, 242, uh, In My Life, 227, Girl, I had no idea. 231, Payback Writer, 219. These are it's like short Ramones. songs. Very the short. difference between those short songs and the short songs today, though, I like that Greedy song, Tate McRae, but there's nothing to it. It's a verse and a chorus, and then a verse. Here's where I disagree, that I think Rick has a very, like, instrumentalist point of view of listening to music is like he doesn't really pay attention to lyrics and vocals he really only pays attention 
to like the instrumentals in songs. So I think he has a perspective on pop music that kind of misses the point sometimes because the entire point of pop music is the lyrics and vocals. And so to only pay attention to the instrumentals, I think is, I don't think that that's the way to listen to pop music. Verse and a chorus, and then some type of bridge, it's not even a bridge, I don't even know what it is, it's like a breakdown verse and one chorus, and then just does this kind of nothing out chorus. It doesn't even do a double chorus at the end. Whereas the Beatles had multiple bridges in these songs. They had intros, they had solos, they had everything. And they fit all this stuff in these amazing songs that you can listen to for the next six. So, so here's, here's my sort of question. I believe there's an unstated assumption here that a lot of, um, a lot of rock fans have is that more complexity means that the music is better. So, I mean, I'm sure he's right. I'd have to go back and listen to these songs, but I mean, Rick knows his shit. So I'm sure he's right that the Beatles put all of these, you know, like crammed all this stuff into a two minute song. I'm sure that's true. But I don't agree with the idea that cramming more stuff into a two minute song is necessarily better. I think the reason that people love all those Beatles songs is because they have a catchy chorus, right? I think the vocal hook is what defines most of the songs. It's potentially valid to say that the fact that we've stripped down these songs and just reduced them to the, the part that people actually care about, which is the hook, that perhaps that's actually better songwriting, maybe. I think that's an equally valid point of view. And so I just want to sort of point out and question this assumption that complexity is inherently a good thing. Because I don't know that it is. 60 years or so. So after looking at the Beatles songs, I said, Layla, how long do you think Smells Like Teen Spirit is? Said, now, this this shocked me. This was really surprising to me. I have no idea. So we looked it up. It's five minutes and one second. I had no fucking idea that this song is five minutes long. Like, what in the fuck? I thought it was like two and a half minutes long. I don't know if there's like a radio edit or something, but there is, I'm sorry, I love Nirvana and I love this song. There's no reason that this song needs to be five minutes long. That is insane. <laughs> five minutes long is brutal. That for sure should have been cut in half. So then I started comparing other songs from that era. Jeremy, 518, huh. Black Hole Sun, 518 also. Brutal. Wow. Man in the Box, 445. Tonight Tonight by Smashing Pumpkins is 414. Plush by SDP is- I, I, I'm sorry, I don't think, like, I could go on about this for a long time, okay? So for anybody who doesn't know, I was a graphic designer for like 10 years. I've been like doing product design and shit my whole career for like 25 years. So I have thought a tremendous amount about the topic of philosophy of art. And in general, I believe that being concise is actually the most challenging thing for artists of any kind. So like people who are new to any art form, like writing, for example, they will go on way too long. Like if you tell them to write a short story, they'll write a fucking 50 page story instead of three pages. Or like graphic designers will try to make this like ridiculously elaborate, complex kind of thing because they want to put everything they have into this composition where as you know, a designer that's been doing it for longer will be like, boop, boop, boop. There's only three things in this, I'm done. Because they have learned restraint and they have learned to edit themselves. So I actually think that when I see long songs, I don't think that like, wow, this is a masterpiece of someone that poured everything they had into this and like every second of this song needed to be there. I think, hmm, this is someone who probably needed to edit themselves more. And if you notice, this is the first album, I don't know about the Smashing Pumpkins, but this is the first album by all these bands, or well, not Soundgarden either, but whatever. Point being is that I think learning to edit yourself and be concise is actually, uh, I believe, one of the most difficult things an artist can do. So I don't believe that long songs are necessarily good. It's 513. These are long songs, twice as long as songs are today. So why were songs so long yeah. back then? This is right. It's much harder to write an amazing eight bars and make it worth listening to for a whole song than it is to write a long, complex structure. That's 100% true. First of all, there were way better written songs. And second of all, there was no internet to say. Yeah, but I don't think there were better written songs. So anyway, I thought this was cool. Cool stuff that Rick shared there and some interesting stuff there about the supposed resurgence of rock and in particular, the uh, the rise of country in the last year. So if you like this, check out Rick's videos. Number one, best air drummer on the planet, 
Respect to Rick. Shout out to the Spotify SREs, as usual.